Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 25th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Getting a quick preview of what I'm going to talk about, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, brought to you by me. Check out my trading service. We're having a pretty good year, if I say so myself. We've got a couple longs in there and uh, quite a few shorts. So, so far, so good. Knock on wood. But check that out. DaveLander.com slash trading service. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or, as I like to say, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I actually got that from Greg Morris. All right, what do we talk about? Well, the main thing I want to talk about today is 10 things that you need to know about trading. I also want to talk about a few other things that are relative, such as uh, money management, position management example, a little follow-up from stuff for some stuff from last week. But this is the main thing I want to talk about. So let's just hop right into it. Number one thing about trend is markets go up and markets go down. And as I said quite a bit when you tell people that, they, they look at you like you pooed your pants. It's kind of like the same look that they give you when you go to Starbucks and you ask for a cup of coffee, which I used to do a few years back before I um, <laughs> got out as much as I get out now. I used to have to bring a teenager with me, that, as I said before. You know, well, what do you want? I, I want? I want a cup of coffee, but I want like a, I just want like a regular cup of coffee, and then I want like a, a, well, what do you, you put some cream and sugar in it? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, uh, you, you want a big one or a little one? Uh, I want a big one. Okay, I, I got it, Dad. Venti, up, brood, room for cream. <laughs> it's like, okay, thank you. Anyway, markets do go up and markets go down. But when you tell people that it might be going down, they get all upset with you. And they try to reason why it should not be going down. And I see this happen time and time again with people. And even people sometimes who know better get stuck in a market that's going down, and then they feel like, well, it's so oversold, it's due to bounce, and they kind of reason why the market should not be going down. As I often say, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. By the way, if you want, this is on the back of my business card. This is my, uh, my tread finder. And if you uh, ever lose your way in the market, you just uh, flip over my business card and hold it up to your monitor. And if you want one, just send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. And that's my business address there, my mailing address. Okay, here's the other thing, too, or number two, I should say. It's always darkest right before it gets more dark. Just like I said a few seconds ago, people reason that a market is low. And let's take a look at that. So the question is, is this market low and is it a value? Well, I think it's kind of a loaded question. You probably know that. But if you come to this peak back here and you measure to where it is, it's uh, down 50-something percent, okay, plus. So the question is, do you think this market is low? Do you think it's a value? Well, obviously it's low. I guess that's, I guess that's a bit of a trick question. But by low, I mean, oh, it's low. It can't go any lower, or it's too low, or it's so low. And the answer is, it could always go lower, okay? And this isn't some obscure little company that nearly went out of business. This is the NASDAQ, okay? And it was down over 50% in early 2001. And near the end of the trend, it was down over 70%. Okay, so you never know how low is low, and that's something that you always have to remember when it comes to markets. Trends can go a lot further and last a lot longer than most people or are willing to believe. And on the upside, the same thing holds true. In the late 90s, I started drawing these big arrows on the chart. And very smart people, people who are a lot smarter than me, were reasoning with me as to why the market should not be going up. And uh, it wasn't necessarily a stock example. I think it was a commodity example. I knew someone who was extremely short, and I kept showing the 
commodity is going up and then I got a nasty email from an anonymous email but I called him out and I know it was him and it's somebody I respected initially I was pretty hurt and they they, they called me a, they said I'm nothing but a trend following moron and initially I felt really bad about that because this is the same individual that really made me feel good about what I was doing and all of a sudden he's calling me dirty names but you know what I got to thinking about it Maybe I am a trend following moron, and next time I've tried to find myself or found myself trying to fight the trend, I should say, I'm like, you know what, let's just follow along. And and through that adversity, I mean, at the time, it felt like adversity. I was really bummed out. But through that, I became a better person. I became a better trader because it's like maybe I shouldn't fight the trends. Maybe I am just a trend following moron. I think the moment you give up your ego about being right – and try to look smart, which which can be a little dangerous if you're you're putting it out there like I do every day because you, you do want to look smart. You do want to be right as much as possible. But it's like we also, on an individual level, put a lot of this pressure on ourselves to be right and look smart. And sometimes you just have to follow along. So never forget to draw your arrows and remember that trends could go a lot further or farther than most people believe they will now the only way to profit from a trade is to capture a trend so you must sell higher than you buy or cover lower than you short so from a to b if this is a here and this is b here notice there's an arrow in between okay Say if they go to short side, this is A here, and this is B here. You have to obviously cover lower than you shorted. So from A to B is a trend. So if you ever find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator or trying to figure out if it's a fifth of a third or a third of a fifth, then come back to trend and ask yourself, is it a trend? And then even further and more simply put, Realize that all you have to do, and I know, ha ha, easier said than done, but all you have to do is sell higher than you buy or cover lower than you sell. So focus on finding that trend and getting on that trend, okay? If you must use an indicator or indicators, then make sure you're still at least looking at the chart and asking yourself. Now, the other great thing about trend and technical analysis, for that matter, is that with technical analysis, in other words, using charts, there is a hard rule, a concrete rule. If a market is going to go from A to C and B is in between A and C, it will have to pass through B along the way so if a market any market is at five and it's going to 20 it's going to pass through 10 along the way now this sort of infers that you could just buy at b and in some cases you can okay i have an ipo strategy out there which i actually call buy at b when ipos have the certain setup early in their trading you could actually buy them very early in the process we it, it's about uh, you need at least five days before you can look to enter. But there is a pattern that I call buy at B. As I've told the story before, I had a young gentleman come to my house. He was flunking his stock selection class or stock picking class in his finance class. And I was all excited. I'm like, oh, great. You know, I'm going to teach this kid money management, position management, uh, persistent pullbacks, bow ties, all these great patterns and strategies and things that I like to do. And kid didn't show up. So finally, I waited an hour, no, two hours, two hours turned to three hours. Finally, I text him or he texts me. I'm on my way. All right, good. Shows up. And I start trying to show him all these things. And he's, he's like looking at his watch the whole time. I'm like, what's up? He goes, well, I'm in between classes. I only have like 15 more minutes. I'm like, all right, fine. This is what you're going to do. Forget about everything I just told you. I want you to buy 
stocks only if they're making a new high. And I set him up on a little stock program on the internet and showed him how to do that. He goes, that's fine, but what if I had also told him to get rid of everything in his current portfolio because he was bottom fishing and stocks were in serious downtrends. Next question was, well, the teacher wants us to trade, so we learn how to trade. And every now and then the teacher will come in and say, we're going to have to make trades today. So what should I do? I said, all right, if you're forced to trade, you can only sell a losing position or the smallest of your winners. You must prune it out of your portfolio. And he went from last to class, and the I checked with him close to the end of the class, and he was in the top three. I don't know how he finished overall. He really could give a flip about the class. He was more interested in his new girlfriend and getting through all these prerequisites so someday he could hopefully go to film school. So he really didn't care. And by the way, there's a, there's a lesson. There's, there's a lesson in psychology right there. So why was he so successful? Because he didn't care, okay? Now, I'm not suggesting you rush out and do just that, buy every time a market makes a new high. But I will tell you this, if you did trade a large basket of stocks, you would probably do pretty good with that. I, As an experiment for about four or five years, that's all I did in a, in a hypothetical portfolio. And the portfolio did really well. And it, uh, it became a lot of work. And I, I recently, uh, you know, I just officially put it into cash at the end of uh, 2015 which probably was a pretty good move, uh, move uh, because number one, it wasn't a whole lot of highs, and, and number two, obviously, the market's rolling over. But I think if you only bought markets that were making new highs, you would probably do a lot better than most of the people out there who are trying to fight it out. It's it certainly, in a year like 2008, you would beat 95% of all money managers. So it's a little bit more complex than just buying when a market makes a new high. But never forget that if you already get on a trend somewhere around B, okay, somewhere around B is a good place to consider getting on. And, and you maybe use a bow tie or a first thrust or a persistent pullback or trend knockout or some combination thereof to get on, okay? Dave, what do you think of trading systems which traded your IPO strategies and also changed your trade strategies only? What do you think of trading system of a trading system which traded your IPO strategies and also your change of trade strategies only? Um, I think you would do quite well because I think that there's a huge opportunity in IPOs, and that's why I decided to do a course on them. And as I said, the course, the the one of the benefits of IPOs is that when conditions begin to worsen, the people who bring them public, the underwriters, or are going to sit on their hands and not bring them public, or hold off, I should say, until conditions get better. So they're going to be self-regulating. So I think if all you did was trade IPOs, I think you could probably be, you'd probably be very successful, but you might sit on your hands for a long, long, long time. But I think it's worth, and, and, you know, soft selling here, I know you have the course, but uh, for those of you who don't, I think it's worth, I think it's worth learning how to trade them, and I think it's worth getting the course, but again, you would probably sit on your hands for quite a bit. In fact, if you want to, since we're soft selling here, if you want to email me, I'll give you a promo code, and I can knock a couple hundred dollars off that course, I'd be happy to do that, and that'll, uh, that'll reduce the um, initial cost, but I do think that I agree with you on that, um, and I like where you're going with that. It's just find something really simple in one small little area and focus on just doing that, at least until you're successful, and then branch out. I often tell people, I know we were talking right before the show, Don, but I often tell other people, um, hey, if you're new to this, just trade persistent pullbacks, and that's all I want you to trade until you get good at that. Once you become successful at that, then maybe branch out to some of these other patterns. And then once you get good at these trend resumption patterns, then get into maybe these uh, trend transition patterns, these emerging trend patterns. And the reason I would say do it in that order, because emerging trends are a little bit tougher. You're going to be wrong a little bit more often, but the chance of winning big makes it all worthwhile. And my ego kind of rears its ugly head when it comes to these emerging trend patterns, because I like – 
I like the the excitement, the thrill, and, and I know I often preach, you know, don't trade for excitement, don't trade for a thrill, don't trade for action. But it's rewarding for me on a personal level, from an egotistical level, if I can get into a new trend as early as possible, and then the game becomes stick with it as long as possible. I'm going to show you a setup here in just one minute. And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we're going to do just that. So, yeah, start small and then build. Okay. We'll get to that, uh, uh, Dathra, when we get to the markets. Okay. Now, number five, indicators don't indicate trend or anything, okay? They illustrate. But, Dave, don't you have the bow tie pattern? You just talked about bow ties. Yeah, I do. And I love my bow tie pattern. But the bow tie doesn't tell you that the market is rolling over. It alerts you to the fact that it might be rolling over. And obviously, we had a major sell signal in 2000, a major buy signal in 2003, major sell signal in 2007, early 2008. This is a weekly chart, by the way, S&P 500, the P's, as I called. And then we had a major buy back in 2003, okay? And as you can see, these signals have been pretty damn powerful. Let's interview myself, or let me interview myself. Did these signals predict the market moves? No, it just told us what was already there. It told us that the trend may be changing, that we may need to pay attention to what's going on. And lo and behold, when you looked at the actual chart, you're like, oh, well, wait a minute. In 2008, well, wait, hang on, hang on. This market's pretty much going straight up. And then now what it's doing, oh, I see it now. It's beginning to roll over when you just look at the price, okay? In 2003, what did it tell you? Well, okay. We see that for two years the market's doing this, and then all of a sudden it starts doing this. So it doesn't indicate anything, but it illustrates what's already there. Now, point number six, you must always start with or come back to net net. I know some very smart people out there, and unfortunately, the smarter you are, the harder it is to trade because you try to put too much logic into things, okay? As I'm going to say in a minute, what is, is. But you never need to forget about, you should never forget, I should say, about the net net change of a market. Is the market higher, lower, or about the same as it was yesterday, the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before, or years before, okay, or months or years before? When we get the S&P 500, we're going to see we're right about where we were about a year and change ago. When we look at the Russell 2000 in a few minutes, it's right about where it was two and a half years ago. So on a net-net basis, longer term, it hasn't changed much. The closing price today in the Russell is pretty much where it was a couple of years ago. Okay, Shorter term to intermediate term, let's just say intermediate term to make it a little simple, the S&P 500 is down significantly over the past six months or so, going back uh, all the way back to I think May was the peak back in May. Okay. So always start by looking at the chart and always first thing you need to do is say, where's the close today and go back in time and look at the closes years past. Don't worry about the highs. Don't worry about the lows. Just look at the close for starters at least. Okay. I think, uh, was it Jesse Jackson was, uh, channeling me there for a while. Don't worry about the lows. Just look at the clothes. <laughs> so, um, number seven, surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. Let me interview myself. Will they always happen in the direction of the trend? No. But in general, it's a pretty good idea to trade in the direction of the trend. Now, I don't watch the news, but I know we were short 
Carnival Cruise Lines recently. And then what happened? We had the Zika surprise come in. Okay. God forbid. I don't want anything bad to happen to anyone or any company. But if I see a pattern, I take it. It's it's what I get paid to do. And I've got to separate myself from feelings or anything like that. I just have to look at the chart and take the trade. Take a look at this company here. And we've we've been blessed with quite a few examples lately, but this was one this one kind of stands out, so I thought it'd be worthwhile. You can see this stock is generally working its way lower, and then what happens? They miss on earnings. So as a general statement, surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trade. Now, if you want to be a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, someone always knows more about you when it comes to a market, when it comes to a stock, or any market for that matter. So their buying and selling will usually be ahead of something like this. They might know about the surprise. So they're going to start selling ahead of time. That selling will help to create a trend. And here's the beauty of technical analysis. Anyone who has to sell a stock has to sell a stock in the open market. And they're going to leave their footprints on the chart. That selling is going to create supply. When you boil it all down, again, if you're plotting that 15th oscillator, stop, take them all off your chart, ask yourself, does this look like a market that has supply or demand? A market that has supply is going down. A market that has demand is what? Going up. Okay. So the big boys or the informed money or the manipulators or whoever you want to call them, they're going to leave their footprints on the chart. They're going to either create demand or create supply. So again, as a general statement, surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. Now, number eight, they're not like a bus, okay? Uh, Peter Mothy, a friend of mine, invited me to speak to a, a technical analysis group in Dallas a few years back, and I've told the story a few times, so bear with me if you've been to these shows. But uh, after the show, I was staying in his house, and um, he gave me a few little pointers on my uh, tip. A little constructive criticism, which I could use. You know, I I, I, uh, I don't get a lot of feedback, and I want to become better, so I didn't mind. And anyway, he pointed out that he used the word streaky. And he says, you got to stop using that word streaky. It makes it sound too elusive. And I don't know how else I could put it. It is a little elusive, okay? There are going to be times when you just absolutely print money. And other times, you can have to sit on your hands and wait. I often talk about African Queen Syndrome. Go back two weeks and check uh, that out. Check out the video. Oh, I'll show you the video page, by the way, in a minute. I'm kind of excited about it. But before I do that, there's going to be times where the market is just grinding along, grinding along, grinding along. And what do you do? You quit. And then what happens? You get a massive trend right afterwards. I tell a story over and over again. But I had a client once that, that kind of gave up on things. And uh, he just quit trading because the market was doing just that. It was going sideways. And then about two or three weeks later, he decides, well, let me just log on just to see what's going on. And I think in the back of his head, he was probably thinking, I want to make sure it still sucks. <laughs> and what happened? We had a portfolio of a bunch of winners, and some of them were quite substantial. And he called me up, and he said, I feel like I broke up with my fiance, and then the next Saturday she won the lottery. Because he gave up, and then he pulls the portfolio, and then, bam, it's right there. Same thing happened recently with quite a few other people. I'm getting emails from people. And they gave up when the market got choppy last year. And then what happened? We had some beautiful trends and beautiful setups and wonderful positions. 
late last year and up until now, knock on wood. We'll take a look at one or two of those in a minute. But most people quit when things are good. Conversely, on the other side, when, when things are when they are in that that period where momentum is there, what do they do? It tends to go to the head. They over leverage. I've seen people just go in and oh Dave, I made I made twenty percent in three months. I, I can't make that much money selling real estate. I'm gonna quit my real estate job or whatever the job may be. And I'm just gonna do this. In fact, I'm gonna put all my money in this and I'm gonna I'm gonna risk twice as much because I want to make forty percent or eighty percent or hundred percent or a thousand percent. And then what happens? They obviously the writings on the wall there. When the market gets choppy again, they get in a lot of trouble. But what usually happens before the market even gets choppy is they start trying to beat the system. They think they've got the holy grail. They think they've got it figured out. And trust me, I don't have all the answers. I'm working on it. And I've been working on it for 20-something years. But I don't have all the answers. And I know it, it's it's a little perverse. The longer you're in this business, when you have these great, wonderful periods, it actually kind of stresses you out because you know at some point it's coming to an end. I think Eckert or somebody wrote about that in Market Wizards, how three months you're hot, three months you're cold, and the other six months you just grind it out. And that's pretty much how it is. The highs are high and the lows are lows and the other low and other times just grind it out. By the way, speaking of grinding it out, that's one of the secrets to trading. You can't say, oh, it's summertime. I'm not going to trade for the next three months. Now, probably more often than not, that's a thing to do. But getting back to the streaky thing, and damn, I said it again. But getting back to that streaky thing, trends can happen in any month of the year. Read Layman's. All this, I'm just kind of quoting straight from Layman's. All these anecdotes and everything, come, or for the most part, are coming straight from Layman's. So if you decide that you're going to take the summer off, that might be the summer that would have made your entire year. And that's why I'm here grinding it out every day. And that's why, to the frustration of my wife sometimes, there is no such thing as a vacation for me. I, I, I carry a laptop with me. She asked me, um, while we in New York, New York, she's like, this is the greatest vacation ever. And I made the mistake of saying that I was still working, you know. So I, I, instead of just, uh, you marry guys out there, just when your wife tells you something, that if you think it's a compliment, just agree with them, okay? <laughs> so, But, yeah, I, I have that laptop with me. I don't really mind. I, I like having it with me. Uh, I like keeping up with the markets, and I know that if I grind it out every day, I might find some big opportunities. So you never know when it's coming along. It's kind of like the uh, keep the, keep the lamp oil. What's the story? Uh, the, the biblical story about the uh, women with the lamp oil. You gotta you can't wait until you see a dude coming down the street, and run down to Walmart, and buy some lamp oil, and light up your lamp so the dude will see you. You got to have some lamp in your oil so you can light that lamp when you see the dude coming, or at least keep the lamp lit, I should say. So that's probably a probably a pretty good job of butchering that that story. I guess I'm not going to be a preacher, even though I do preach a lot. Anyway, they're not like a bus; they don't come along every day. At Livermore, you always get something good out of Jesse Livermore and reminiscence reminiscence of a stock operator. He's got a lot of really good quotes and anecdotes and things in there about uh, about that. A lot of people think that they can expect the market to give them a, a constant paycheck, and it simply it simply won't do that. And I like to see this longer term capital growth. And there might be times where return of capital is more important than return on capital. So you might just have to sit on your hands and wait for that next trend. So. Don't quit too soon because the trend might be just around the corner. And then if you are in a trend, consider yourself blessed, but realize that it won't last forever. Now, number nine, they're hard to ride. Okay. Covell wrote a book about trend following, and then somewhere in the book he called it, or he uh, equated it to riding a bouncing Bronco. And then later on, he actually changed the cover of his book to have a guy riding a bouncing Bronco, which looks a lot like um, this picture here. My, my cord won't reach my bookcase anymore, so I can't run over and go grab it and see. But you get the idea. It's hard. 
Now, the beauty is we could sometimes use this propensity to our advantage. So let's say a market is, is trending nicely and we recognize that. And then we have a sharp sell off. This is the pattern I call a TKO. OK. So a TKO or trend knockout, for those of you who aren't familiar with the pattern, that sharp sell off knocks out some people who are on the trend or in the trend. OK. Fast money, people who buy late into a trend, they're going to be kind of the fickle investors and they're going to be the first out. For instance, a friend of mine's wife, a friend of my, my wife's friend, I should say, called me the other day. She just started investing in 2015. You know, good for her. I'm glad she's looking, looking out for her future. Good for her. Unfortunately, she's already losing a lot of money because, number one, she's in loaded funds. That's a different story altogether. And number two, the guy's like, oh, we're in for the long haul. So within a year of beginning to throw money at the market, a significant amount of money, because she's got some young children and she's looking out for their future, in her future, the family's future, she's already forced to look at that investment. So whoever's late into the game will likely be the fast money or the first out. And on a more extreme case, if you have a stock that's at an obvious trend like this and somebody buys late in the trend, they're likely to be the first out. So if you hop on the trend and then some people hop on later in that trend and that trend begins to turn or at least has a sharp, sharp sell off, they're going to bail out quickly. And a lot of times they're going to take you out with them. Now, if you're not in the trend and you see this pattern, there's the beauty. And if you are in a trend, you get knocked out. Sometimes you get back in. That's okay. But the beauty of this pattern is it's it's we're using the psychology of the market's participants against themselves. I know that sounds a little mean, but that's what we do. That's how we roll. The other thing it does is it attracts eager shorts and eager shorts. Shorts, as a general statement, think they're smarter than everyone else. But Dave, don't you smart? You say you're smarter than everyone? Don't you short? Don't you think you're smarter than everyone else? No, no, I'm not smarter than everyone else. I'm just follow along. But as a general statement, Shorts like to pick tops and sell when the market is high and do all these bad things. So when they see this market begin to sell off in a knockout move, what do they do? They pile on, okay? And again, the shorts piling on or the nervous Nellies or the Johnny Come Latelys, J-O-H-N-N, -N, Johnny Come Latelys, they're going to knock you out of that position. But we actually use this to our advantage if we try to get on the trend, if the trend begins to resume. We also, if we get knocked out of it, not often, but every now and then, if you go back and look at the trading service archives, you'll see we'll get knocked out of a trend at a sharp sell-off, and the next day we will buy that market right back on a trigger of a, of a TKO. We don't just buy it back. We buy it back when it begins to trend higher again and take out the top of the TKO. So trends are really hard to ride, and, and I don't know what's the best analogy to describe it. I mean, the bouncing Bronco is a good analogy, but the the reality of why that is is it's the market's job to shake out as many participants as possible. And I don't know really a, a good way of explaining that, but obviously there's buying and selling that happens, and people jockey for positions. So even when you do have a good trend, there's going to be some serious retraces along the way. And again, we could use this propensity to our advantage. One of the patterns I like on the short side is the witch hat, which kind of looks like a witch's hat. This is like a think of like a witch hat. I'm not as I don't like it as much on the long side. I like it more to short side. So it's really one of my few patterns that's really more of a short side strategy or short side setup than it is a, a long strategy. But what happens is you get this sharp retrace rally, the market runs out of steam right around a prior little peak, and then quite often can roll over. That could be a wonderful place to short. And if you're aggressive or a day trader, maybe, you could even look to get into like an opening gap reversal when you have a witch hat or something like this. So they're hard to ride, but we have to realize that we could actually use this propensity to our advantage. We also use money management techniques so that we can hopefully stay in that trend for a long, long time. That brings us to our next point. You can't predict them, but you could follow them forever. 
I was interviewed on uh, Monday, a video interview for Traders Expo. The only problem with those those uh, videos is they talk, where are you finding opportunities? And I tell them and I talk about what I like and when I'm shorting, when I'm buying, et cetera. And then they show the video six months from now. <laughs> they post it on their website. So uh, I was asking about that. It's like, well, we you know, we just kind of send them off and, and, and they show up when they show up. Um. You know, the guy says, I'm just kind of the messenger. I'm the guy interviewing. Uh, but uh, so hopefully those will show up real soon. But in, in those interviews, one one of the things that just kind of slipped out, and, and I don't remember what I said. I'm dying to see the video again so I could see what I said because I thought I had a, a pretty good quote. just kind of slipped out. But I said something along the lines of, you can't predict them, but you can ride them forever. So that's why we take partial profits. You can only predict the short term if they're predicted at all, but your your chances of predicting the short term, you see a nice little bow tie set up and a nice little pullback or whatever the case may be, or TKO, you know that that market has a pretty good chance of either resuming that emerging trend or continuing that longer term trend, but you don't know how long that trend will continue. So this brings us to our next point, smoke them if you got them, okay? So this is a recent setup. This is an aluminum stock for my friends over across the pond, aluminum stock for everyone here. And we had a very nice looking bow tie in this stock. And we got a trigger here. We gave it a little bit of wiggle room to avoid a false entry. And knock on wood, or luckily, within a couple days, we were able to take partial profits. Stock ran up about 40%. Now, this number doesn't really matter. I mean, it's impressive to tell people, hey, I made 40% in a couple of days. But the reality is this stock is very volatile, and 40% is not that big of a move for this stock. The good news is, though, it was enough for us to get partial profits out of the position, and we were able to move that stop from where it was up to break even, Okay. So now, if this stock comes down and stops us out, then it becomes what I call the better than a poke in the eye trade. We make a little buddy, and we get stopped out of it. That's okay. If that's the worst you ever did, you'd own the world in a few years, okay? Maybe even sooner. Obviously, we do occasionally have losses. <gasps> Dave, you said losses. I've never heard anyone say losses before. Well, sooner or later, you will have some losses. That I can guarantee. One of the few things I can guarantee Anyway, the reason we take partial profits is this is a big question mark out here. What did I just say? We can't really predict them, but we could follow them forever. So hopefully we're with this position for a long, long time. Now, what I'm going to do is now that my stop is up here, right around the same as my entry. And if we survive this uh, recent little correction or whatever, this takes back off again. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly let this stop widen out as opposed to trailing it on a one-for-one -one basis, I'm gonna let it widen out. In other words, let me show you again, okay? Instead of trailing it like straight up, as a stock goes straight up, I'm gonna to get to kind of let it open up a little bit, so hopefully I can ride out those longer-term trends. The reason, long, the reason longer-term trend following has abysmal results, well, I should say abysmal, I shouldn't say abysmal, You'll make the most amount of money tr trading longer term trends. You're also going to lose the most amount of money too. And you're going to be wrong the most amount of time. But David, thought you a trend follower. I am. But follower is the key word in that sense. So how do you follow? Well, you find that little swing trade. You get your little money out or half your money out, I should say, those partial profits. You bump that stop to break even. And then you implement a plan which allows you to transition into the longer term trader to hopefully catch that longer term move. If you just go out from the get go and try to just on every trade, just go, oh, I'll put all my money in this trade and hopefully hold on for a long, long time and see what happens. You're going to eventually you might do really well for a while, but then you probably will blow up at some point. And there's a lot of famous people out there. You can Google them that you've probably read about that you were like, wow, that's really impressive. But they fail to tell you, it's like, yeah, we later blew up. Okay. So longevity is key. You want to be, the, be at this for a long, long time. 
And the only way to make a lot of money in the market is to capture a longer-term trend. But they are elusive. They are hard to find. They, it's streaky. I'm sorry. It's streaky. I don't have a better way of putting it. Sorry, Peter. So the only way to capture a longer-term trend, and you know, you're not supposed to say in my opinion because it's redundant, and I can't give the opinion of others anymore, at least. <laughs> I never could, I guess. Uh, I'm not allowed to give the opinions of others. But the only way to make a lot of money in the market is to capture a longer-term trend. And the only way that I could figure out how to do that is to take short-term profits and then be willing to stick with the trend as long as possible. So i got to find that quote, okay? You can't predict them but you could follow them forever and follow is a key word in that sentence. All right. A lot of questions coming in. Great bunch today. All right. Reverence preach question. <laughs> yes, they do. I do preach too. Okay. What time frame is the question? Uh, I forgot what the question is. Uh, the question is, you can't predict them. You can predict short term. Okay. But you don't know longer term. I often show um, what they call that thing, an odds probability cone, where you have a market. Let's redo this. You have a market that looks like this. And then based on the volatility of that market, you do a probability cone. It looks like a some sort of like a SAR or whatever you want to call it, a parabola, I guess is the, the correct word. And this gets wider and wider the further out you go. Now, I don't use these type of indicators. I think the options guys like to mess around with this kind of stuff. But it kind of gives you an example of what's possible as far as, or I should say, what's what's really unknown. So the further out you go, the more unknown you're going to be. So, yeah, can you rephrase the question? Okay, the question is, Dathan says, do you feel that this is the big retrace rally and shorting that normally happens, or do you just feel it's just a big witch hat formation overall market? Well, it's not quite a witch hat yet. We'll pick apart the market in a few minutes. When we get, we're almost there. We'll pick apart the market in a few minutes. But uh, not quite the, the witch hat, but, yeah, we certainly could have a big retrace, but I don't know if I'd call it a witch hat, though, and I'll show you why. The market is a bad teacher day. It's selling the R2000 in May 24. 4,000 was right, but, okay, dramatic pause, is Craig, okay, what's the but, Craig? Okay, a couple little uh, follow-up things from last week. Uh, last week, uh, one of the things I said was the market could be a bad teacher, and we have a good example this week of, once again, how the market is a bad teacher. Last week, Someone wanted to get out of MOH instead of waiting for the stop to get hit at 62. And what did I say? Will you save $2 by doing that? And my answer was probably. You'll probably save 2 bucks by doing that. But if the trend continues, that $2 is the equivalent of tripping over the nickels while going for the dollar. So, so what if you give up a couple of points in the trade? You still get out for a pretty decent profit. You'll make, um, oh, I don't know, what's 62, 64 by this 62. You'll still make four points on a trade. That's better than poking the eye. I'll take that any day of the week. I know I shouldn't say it. I say it every week. But any time my clients complain because we gave up some open profits, I tell them just, okay, whatever profits you made in the trade, send them to me. Centip Trading, LLC, <laughs> PO Box 298 at Beatty Springs, Louisiana, 70420, 70420. Send those profits to me and then go center yourself somewhere. Go meditate. Try to forget about that trade. And I'll take those profits from you. And in 20 something years of doing this, I've never received any cash in my mailbox from that. So, so what if you got to give us some open profits? Get over it. I think it was uh, Dennis in one of the turtle books, uh, the one that Curtis Faith wrote, which I recommend you do read, by the way. Um, 
even though I don't think that's a viable longer term strategy. But I think it's worth reading just because of the mentality in there. Little things like they had a ping pong table to keep them busy when there was nothing to do. That's brilliant. I should, uh, my wife would shoot me, but if I took the, 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 I'm working, I work in the front of my guest house. If I took the bed out the back, uh, so it was no longer a place for our guests and put a ping. I'd love to put a ping pong table back there just for symbolism purposes. You know, I don't know who I'm going to play ping pong with because I'm here by myself most of the time. But I think it's a great. Uh, be great for symbolism. But so what if you give up some of that open profit? So micromanagement, once again, proves to be the thing to do. But longer term, it will not be the thing to do. You cannot get out at the first signs of adversity, especially on the short side. You have to be willing to give up some open profits. And it just is what it is. Ping pong, just drink beer. <laughs> yeah, I've got uh, I've got some beer in the uh, in the fermenter that needs to be uh, kegged. Okay, we'll get to that. Uh, Death and we get the charts. Uh, good questions, though. Keep them coming. Um, for what it's worth, I um, I've been uh, working to uh, revamp my website. The old website was a little bit of a mess, and I was um, I kind of agree. Let me just show you real quick. I'm not going to waste too much of your time, but the home page we got a lot of good stuff on here, and I'll put as many announcements and everything up top. If you scroll down to the bottom. This is the latest commentary down here. So that's where it is now. Or you can go straight to the blog to get it. And obviously just go through these menus. But I want to show you today, my YouTube videos are kind of a mess. I've worked hard to put a lot of great content out there. And again, in my humble opinion. But they're not very organized. So what I started to do is I started to organize them here on the video page. So check that out after the webinar. And then when I... Um, I'll start putting the newer weekend charts on here too. And they'll also appear first in the blog. Which might be a little slow to load because I'm, I'm banging the bandwidth pretty hard with this other thing. Howard says, do you make your own beer? Yes, I do. I own a microbrewery, 20 gallon microbrewery. My wife, you know, the problem with me is everything I do is an obsession. So it's like my wife gave me a beer kit a few years back. I'm like, oh, geez, here we go. <laughs> so, But anyway, uh, that's the video page. Check it out when you get a chance. The bandwidth's not going to let it load probably uh, live. But uh, the website has been revamped, and I think it's uh, looking a lot better, if I say so myself. So, and yes, I will be recording this um, this session, or I am recording the session, I should say, that will appear soon. Okay, let me finish with the slides real quick, and then we'll hop into the um, charts. Um, if you do want to follow along and you don't have a lot of money, then follow along for free until you learn how things work, both good, bad, and indifferent, until you see a print money phase, a choppy phase, uh, and something somewhere in between. So you can follow along with my four-sided hindsight service and that's completely free and that's you're gonna see so this this the way the reason I, I put this delayed service out there is so you can't say oh look at Dave he shows these great examples in the week of charts but uh, what what's what's happening in real time you know what let me see that ahead of time or, or let's see what he actually recommended that okay so you you can see everything warts at all if I get in delayed service and I love that if you would come onto the live service with me. And I think that uh, I got to be careful not to say it pays for itself because obviously it's for education purposes only. And a lot of people are asking me that, uh, will it pay for itself? I don't know, but I would hope that it would. And I think that I do a pretty good job of, of finding opportunities. I mean, it's what I do, you know? <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's hop out to the charts. Both good, bad, and indifferent. Oh, I got you. <laughs> that sounds like a yogiism, huh? Both good, bad, and indifferent. Okay, let's um I'm gonna go with black charts if you guys don't mind. Um 
we took a vote a few weeks back and we thought that black works better for uh, presentations. I like to use white in my slides so I can draw on them, but black for presentation purposes. Okay, uh, Dathan, we'll get to that in just one second. Okay, here we go. All right, let's take a look at the micro. Oh, if you guys want to start, uh, if you guys want to start asking questions about individual stocks, feel free to do so. Craig's going to sound like a shill. Craig says, you can't say it. I can. The service has paid for itself every year for me. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Well, I put my heart and soul into it. I really do. And I want to look smart, and I want people to learn. And no, I'm not always right. No, it's not always good as it is now. Again, that, that, that streaky thing comes to mind. Damn, I said it again. All right, let's take a look at the short term when it comes to the market, and then let's work our way out to the longer term. Shorter term, it's getting choppy, guys. Take a look at this market. It's down. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's becoming what I call a Jackie Mason market. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. Now, what did we talk about a few minutes ago? We talked about net, net change. And that's one thing that kind of jumps out at me right now. Margin call. How many times I have to tell you every Thursday I do a show. Okay. So if we look at net, net change, we see that the market is pretty much where it was way back in early January. So now we have what? It's a 24. So let's just all intents and purposes, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. So we got six weeks of sideways trading. So it is going a little sideways in here. Okay. Now let's back to mark out, mark back to chart out a little bit, to see the forest for the trees. And if you go with this peak or this peak, whichever one you want to go with, you can see that the market is down significantly so it's still in a downtrend, not a perfect, clean downtrend, but it's getting pretty choppy. And longer term, as you can see, we've traded mostly sideways. If we back out to a weekly chart, it's starting to look a little bit more ominous. You can see that, as I've drawn before, you've got the longer term trend here, and now it's beginning to kind of roll over. And then when we put the weekly bow ties in, as I've said, a nauseam, we had the signal last summer. Market went up, almost made new highs. Got an email from somebody telling me I'm, I'm FOS. I should probably consider could uh, consider another line of work. I was like, well, I believe in what I see, and not necessarily what I believe. And I see that the market could be rolling over in here. And you know what? If it goes on to make new highs, I'm wrong, and that's fine with me. Because what am I? A trend following moron. I'm going to follow along as that market continues to make new highs. And that's completely fine with me. So we still have that major sell signal. We still have a major top that remains in place until and unless the market makes new highs. Somebody asked me at Traders Expo, hey, Dave, you got a bunch of shorts on right now. What's going to happen if that market goes straight back up and make new highs? Because you said you wouldn't become bullish unless it makes new highs. Or are you going to get wiped out on all your shorts? I'm like, well, I might get stopped out on all my shorts, but I'm not going to get wiped out because, first of all, we're profitable on most of them, so we're just going to give up some open profits. So what? We get paid to trade. We get paid to put capital into harm's way. And then we'll start getting along, and that's fine with me. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ looks a little bit worse than the P's because – it almost looks like a pullback. It almost kind of looks like a witch hat. Now, somebody was just asking me about a witch hat, and I'll get to your question in just one second, but let me just draw uh, a witch hat and show you what a witch hat is. A witch hat is when a market is in a serious downtrend. When the market is in a serious downtrend, might have a little bit of a rally, has a, resumes that downtrend, but then has a sharp, sharp retrace back up. It stalls somewhere around that prior little peak, okay? 
So it's kind of like a minor double top within the trend, if you want to call it that, however you want, however you want to wrap your head around it. So if we take a look at the, the NASDAQ, you'll see that it has a somewhat similar pattern to that. Let's clean this chart up a little bit. But the reason I wouldn't rush out to call it a witch hat just yet is because we're really dotted to we're really dotted to clean air. Oops. So let's take a look at that. Let's back the chart out a little bit. So if you back the chart out, you're still kind of in this wide loose trading range, if you want to call it that. And notice that this little sell off here really didn't take out this peak decisively. So you want it to look like this. And then you might just want a little bit of a bump up, and then you want this to continue significantly before it retraces back up. But, yes, it's in the spirit of the pattern where you do have – let me clean the chart up and draw it for you – where you do have a bit of that witch hat-like pattern because you've got this sharp V in here, and we are kind of stalling towards the prior highs. But ideally, you would want this whole formation to be a little further down from the trend, okay? and a more established longer term downtrend but it still looks pretty ugly and it still looks like a major top remains in place and you can plot your bow ties or whatever you want to plot and call it whatever you want just to call me late for dinner uh the sector action is getting a little choppy let's take a look at russell first then we'll take a look at, we'll just take a look at a few sectors don't worry uh, we'll hop into keep your keep your stock picks coming i'm going to get to them in just one second i promise we'll have plenty of time today and keep the questions coming too. Uh, Russell 2000 just doesn't look too good. Pretty serious downtrend in place if you want to draw it like that. So far, just kind of retracing. And, you know, kind of like the NASDAQ, it does have a little bit of that witch hat look to it. Back to chart way out and draw your sideways arrow or draw your line. And you can go all the way back to 2013. For all intents and purposes, that's a bear market. The media likes to say, oh, markets, uh, if it's down 20%, it's a bear market. Well, guess what, folks? Let me show you something here. So that's 20-something percent drop. So technically, according to media metrics or media measurements, however you want to look at it, that's a bear market. Now, Russell 2000 is 2,000 stocks. That's a broad-based measure. So... I don't think you should shrug that off. And I know I've been talking about it for a long, long time. We had a bow tie on this thing way back here on a daily chart. And then we had weekly charts trigger. So I wouldn't shrug that off right away. I mean, I wouldn't shrug it all at all, not right away. Okay, let me just talk a little bit about the sectors real quick. Um, Somebody was asking me about bonds at the expo, and they were worried about uh, uh, what do you call it when interest rates go negative? Uh, deflation. And I said it's pretty scary. I mean, the Fed's ta the Fed tapped the brakes, and bonds have gone up. So so far, bonds are in an uptrend. I wouldn't rush out and trade. I'm mean, a little hard to trade sometimes, but it is kind of scary that we've had such a a big uptrend. Now, getting back to stocks, it's no big shocker. Like the overall market, a lot of areas are starting to get a little choppy here, like the civics. So if you're following along with the service, whether delayed or real time, you're going to see that we're having more and more setups come off, potential setups come off. In fact, today, we have no setups for today. I had a few that we were looking at recently. I decided to take them off, and I'm ready to let things shake out a little bit. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that I won't take a setup tonight. If I see a setup, I take it. It's what I call a Steve Winwood trade. But right now, I think things are getting a little choppy. But for the most part, just throw a dart at most areas. This is software, for instance. This still looks like it's in a lot of trouble. And it's not it's not that choppy, but it still looks like it's in a lot of trouble. You can see pretty serious slide in place and so far it's only pulled back. So Take a pick. Most sectors look like they're still in trouble. The energies look like they're trying to bottom out a little bit. And again, I was talking with someone else at Traders Expo, and we were kind of talking about that it might be more of a process than an event. And I, I can't certainly argue with that because so far it's gone mostly sideways in here as far as the energies are concerned. Now, metals and mining 
a little bit different story. We had a pretty good thrust from lows in here. So far, so good. Gold has kind of melted up, no pun intended. My only problem with gold is there's a lot of overhead supply to deal with, and that's why I haven't rushed out and recommended a lot of gold stocks. I've had a few on the radar that I've been showing lately on my Landry list, but I haven't rushed out and made any direct recommendations in the in the gold stocks simply because there's a lot of overhead supply. So, yeah, you might catch a nice swing trade out of this, but I think that longer-term trade is going to be hard to sustain. So, But I'm looking, and I'm looking hard to find something worthwhile. So no need to go through the rest of these. For the most part, uh, with the exception of, like, utilities, most areas look like they're in a lot of trouble. Utilities are trying to make new highs in here. That might just be a play off the interest rate sensitive areas. I'm not seeing a whole lot of utilities to get excited about, but obviously I'm keeping an eye on the situation. So buy side, metals and mining with, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, gold, I would say, maybe. And then uh, on the short side, just keep an eye out on stocks in general. Look for those right now. We're still in the fairly early phases of a rollover. I got asked a couple weeks ago, when do I go to longer term trend resumption patterns? And I don't know. That depends. Uh, there's a few REITs that are in longer term trends now, but I would much rather sell the REITs that are just beginning to roll over. Okay. All right. Lots of questions coming in. Let's go ahead and jump into individual stocks and finish up the questions. Okay. All right. Dave, what do you think about VLRS? Is it TKO? VLRS? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, a, a TKO needs to be in a trend that looks like this, and then you have the knockout move. Okay. So in a case like this, you're just getting past the prior high. You're barely getting past the prior high, and then you pull it back into that, below that high. So I actually would not want to take this chart at all. Okay. Okay, that's it. Said, Dave, I was studying historical market charts and saw most market corrections came in the second half of the year. However, there were a few corrections that started in the first half of the year, and they all ended very, very badly for the overall market. Is this a coincidence, or is there some sort of market psychology I'm not aware of? Well, there's a lot of adages out there that say, as goes January, so does the market, and things like that. Now, I would answer that question out of both sides of my mouth. From a psychological standpoint, I think that makes sense because I think people come into a new year like, oh, I'm going to put some money in the stock market. And then it's like things don't work out. They begin to change their tune. And I think that there's probably more pressure coming into the new year to, to dump stocks when they're not working well. And I think that could feed upon itself. Now, on the flip side, I would not – try to trade something like that you always have to ask yourself uh you know here's here's a good question it's observable but is it tradable okay and for me to trade something i've got to see quite a few examples the problem with something like that is it's kind of like the sell the main go away okay as a general statement it's probably works but you don't have a representative sample. We only have about 100 years of good market data for the United States, maybe a little bit more. And I don't think you have a, a big enough representative sample because here's the thing. Let's say there is some sort of edge. It could not work for the next five, six years. It did start working again, and then it would still sort of be within that statistical realm of, of still being valid as far as the statistics are concerned. So I would be careful with that. Statistics are worthless. 73.4% of all people know that, okay? But yes, uh, is there something there? Yes. Uh, is it tradable? No. Okay, John wants to know, uh, do we have a bow tie and hooey? Okay, let's take a look at hooey. Uh, yeah, there was a bow tie a while back, if I had to guess, in that one. And let's get a boat. Let's get the bow tie set up. Uh, let's see. Yeah, your bow tie was back here, but in a case like this, we're just kind of go straight up. I would call that more of a first thrust type of setup. I guess the semantics don't matter, but yeah, absolutely. Now here's the problem. As I said earlier, your setup goes right into a massive amount of overhead supply. So I'm a little concerned it's going to cap your gains there. 
I would have much rather preferred gold to bottom out for another year or two and then really take off in a major way. So it was a setup not too long ago. Now it looks like a new developing trend, but we'll have to wait for a pullback and see how that sets up before we get in. Okay. My son got me a beer kit for a present. It's still in the garage. Well, to my surprise, you can make some pretty good beer at home. Now I have a very complicated system um, and I could pretty much mimic any beer in the world. But yeah, you just have to follow the directions. It'll it'll come out a lot better than you think. You can't say it. I can. The service is paid for itself here. Okay, yeah, Craig. Thanks again on that one. I might need to quote you on that if you don't mind. Okay, the question is, hey, Dave, is anything about CNX you like more than CNX or ATI Metals? Just wondering. Something in CNX pattern helped me uh, predict the big. If something in a CNX pattern helped predict the big. I actually, I actually had CNX, CNX and C. ENX are both in the portfolio right now. Let's take a look at the portfolio. Now, I talked last week that CENX was a discretionary call because the trigger was like right here, and it didn't trigger. And I said, hey, guys, tomorrow this stock will likely trigger on the open, but that doesn't mean it's going to guarantee any follow-through. So let's be really careful on this and – not take the position if it triggers and reverses as it did. Now, as far as mechanical tracking is concerned, it's in the portfolio because I don't want to confuse people, especially those new to the service and new to the methodology. But I like them both, okay? And CNX happened to be the one that took off. And so far, knock on wood, looks like it's going to pay for the CNX, okay? Do you send out beers to service subscribers? You know, I could. <laughs> That's a good idea. U.S. Post Office won't let you ship it, but uh, I think UPS will. It's obvious, Dave Craig. What's obvious? Thomas wants to know about Amazon. Amazon, I think, is still in trouble. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is retail. It did sort of look like it was going to implode, and then it came back sharply. Um, let's see if we could jump to the industry. So retail kind of had this big retrace up in here. It looked like it was going to die. It had this big retrace up. It still might die, but for some reason, it just went straight back up. You know, welcome to the short side. Getting back to Amazon. If you go back a few weeks, and it might even have been a few months or even longer, you'll see that in one of my chart shows. In fact, I can show you exactly right here, in this one right here, on, on uh, January 14th. Looks like the video page finally loaded. Um, I talked about all the big cap stocks that would likely drag the market down. And you could actually go back a few weeks, maybe even months prior to that. I was also concerned about it then, but I made a really strong case in mid-January. And Amazon was one of them in my list. And it was probably way back here when I talked about that. Where's the 14th? Yeah, looks like it was in an early phase of rolling over back then. Uh, the problem with shorting it now is, though, it's too many days of the pullback for me to short it. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, is it still in trouble? Yes. As I interviewed myself, should you short it? I think it's two days of the pullback. However, if you do look at a two-day chart, or maybe even a three-day chart, uh, the picture becomes a little clearer, and I think, yes, you're right. I think you're onto something. You could certainly do a lot worse, okay? Now, the beauty is if you read the GoGo Nomo strategy on my website, I'm a big fan of inefficient stocks or stocks that are more inefficient, like the little biotech, the little aluminum company that we're long – uh, or something like that on the long side, but on the short side, I'm okay with efficient stocks or more efficient stocks, I should say, such as a big cap stock that actually has fundamentals. I'm not looking at the fundamentals, but I think that especially if we enter a bear market, if you go in and read the article I've done on more than one occasion, if you, if you just Google rats on my site, go to my site and click in rats, I guess, on the uh, in the box, search box. Uh, you'll come up with a couple of articles on how rats leave a ship. 
And what happens is you have this kind of flight to these stocks that have some kind of substance to them. So here you go right here, how rats leave a ship. So the small cap first, small cap stocks are first to go. Okay. Now what's the, what's, what's going on? The Russell 2000 would happen. It's already gone. Okay. The large cap stocks, there's somebody that kind of runs into the large cap stocks because people are running away from those, those speculative issues, the no fundamentals or whatever. And then they, well, we want something that has actually is, is a solid company, uh, whatever. And so the large cap stocks are up here. And then all of a sudden you get to the defensive issues. So what are we seeing now, folks? <laughs> I hate when people say that, folks. But what are we seeing now, guys? I don't know if that's any better. Russell 2000, bam, it's gone. Okay, that's your small cap stocks. Big cap stocks, Amazon, Netflix, beginning to crack a little bit. So what's next? Defensive stocks. Foods and utilities. And what are they doing? They're rallying, okay? So that's kind of that that's kind of that rat getting to the bow, so to speak, from a figurative sense. Figurative sense. So yeah, I, th I still think it's a trouble. E L L I is that ready for a pullback? E L L U? E L L I. E L L I. Uh, is it ready for a pullback? Well, as I said earlier, I mean, it could go up forever and not have a pullback, okay? Uh, but the problem with it now is if it begins to pull back now, it's going to pull back past the prior high. That's what I just was talking about, a stock, uh, that little, uh, whatever that stock was a minute ago. So, uh, Nish, hold off on that one for now. See if it can continue higher, okay? And then look to trade a pullback. Now, here's the next thing. As long as the market is headed lower, or as long as the market still looks like it's in trouble, a long side setup is really going to have to knock my socks off. It's really going to have to be pretty good. Craig says, it's obvious, Dave. What's obvious? I had a call spread on it, short strike at 90. Well, you know me, I like to uh, keep... Um, I like to keep it simple. So you're short at 90 and long at uh, long outside. Yeah, my problem with uh, nothing wrong with that, 95. Okay, so short at 90 and long at 95. My only problem with um, with options, not my only problem, but my main problem is that there's a lot of moving parts. So Nish, if that's something that you do, then by all means do it. Just make sure that it's – just make sure you know that it's a very complex thing to do. So he's got a call spread, I'm guessing. Short the inside, long the outside. Um, I like to position myself for the potential of unlimited gains and limited losses. And a lot of times, if you're not careful, a lot of option strategies do just the opposite. And it's a wonderful way to have a very brilliant but brief career on Wall Street. So just tread lightly on the options. Guys and dolls, K Thor. The problem is the questions come in and they're out of contact. So uh, Phil wants to know about EA as a short. Yeah, I like that one, or did like it at least. Uh, too many days of the pullback now. I know what I know what you're doing, Phil. I see that 50-day moving average right there, huh? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. That's three weeks of pulling back. So uh, let me interview myself. Is the stock still in trouble? Yes. Maybe take a look at a four-day chart, even a five-day chart, a weekly chart. So this looks like the mother of all tops, and I hear you. On our weekly chart, you can short it below this low. That looks like, I hate to use the word safe, because there is no such thing as a safe setup. But, yes, that looks like a stock that's still a lot of trouble, and you have a tremendous amount of overhead supply. Uh, you can almost short it below the low and put a stop above the high. Now, it does not necessarily fit my methodology because I'm working off a daily time frame. But, yeah, I hear you, Phil. Uh, pull back to that 50-day moving average, longer term. It looks like a big picture top, so I can't argue with you too much. Craig says that you work really hard and care about your clients. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Financials, question mark. Um, well, no, <laughs> unless you want to short them. Uh, there's your witch hat. That looks, that looks, that's the closest thing. That's a little bit closer to a witch hat that uh, we've seen so far. So uh, 
this is a market looks like it's in a lot of trouble. We've got the bad tick back. Well, it's actually in the bad tick because that was a bit of that mini flash crash or whatever. Um, yeah, I think it's still in trouble. I wouldn't rush out and short it. I think I would maybe look for some opportunities and some individual issues instead. Like ASIO into earnings next week. Well, I'm, I'm not, I don't care about earnings. And the reason I don't care, like I just showed you with the AIZ, is surprises usually happen in the direction of the trade. Now, don't go out and trade AutoZone next week saying, oh, Dave says surprises happen in the direction of the trade. Uh, this is going to be a no-risk trade. No, no, I mean, you're going to get whacked sooner or later. But more often than not, the surprise is, is you're going to get paid on that surprise, provided that you found the setup and picked it up uh, just right, and, and, et cetera. No, it, it, AutoZone, by the way, is not, it's in an uptrend here, shorter term, all over the place, a little bit longer term. So I would leave that alone either way, even though there is earnings next week. ATVI, it's going to look a lot like Christmas for short. AVTI? That's Activision? Yeah, that's on my Landry list, or was. So we can't talk about that one. Did I just talk about it? Oops. So it put 700, 710, 720. Well, on what? Amazon? Or on the on the uh, AutoZone? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a little dangerous. You know, you're selling puts. I don't know. Um, how much you're going to make? How much you're going to risk? Um Something bad could always happen. I mean, uh, what happened with uh, Hewlett Packard or whatever? CEO decides he's going to sexually harass someone in the company. Company loses, I forget how many billion overnight because of that. So I don't know. Something bad could always happen. So your short puts, if something bad happens, I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't know. I can't give you a good example about what might happen to AutoZone. Um, I do support them a lot, though, so I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, I'm getting questions about, did you see my question? Uh, yeah, I've got about 100 questions here, so uh, I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. ABMD as a short. Um, a lot of support below the market, and it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. So I, I agree with you, Phil. I think it's in trouble. But I wouldn't rush out and short it. Too much support. I prefer something that's a little bit cleaner. <laughs> you are a trend following Maggi. Certainly not moron. Thank you, Susan. I missed you last week. Where were you? Dathan says a lot of individual stocks look more closely related to a witch hat. Uh, do you trust it yet? Well, uh, I don't know if trust is a good word, but if you see a setup, you take it. I mean, we had... You know, take a look at the AIZ. You had a bow tie. You had a uh, first thrust down. We took it. Uh, OZRK, you had a bow tie, you know, and then now it's at a longer term trend. So you just see a setup. You take it. That's what I call a Steve Winwood trade. I don't try to go and say, um, this is my overall feeling and I'm going to stick with this or do I trust this? I just say, okay, here's a setup. It may or may not work, but I think it's worth a shot. Okay. Craig says, can you explain the psychology behind a deeper pullback with the witch hat? Yeah, the psychology is that you have this sharp retrace rally, and on the short side, that buying often exhausts itself because you might have some buyer, you might have some uh, bottom pickers that jumped in, and you certainly and likely have some shorts who have covered. Well, short covering will only take a market so far because you run out of you run out of shorts to cover. So the shorts get squeezed, the shorts run in, the shorts rush in, they all try to run to the door at the same time, the market goes straight up. And then what happens? That buying exhausts itself. So bottom pickers could only they're only going to pick the bottom so much and then once it starts going higher, they're going to start sitting on their hands again because they oh, they think they they picked the bottom. So the psychology behind the witch hat is that you have a sharp retrace, which is mostly and likely short covering, and it might be a little bit of bottom fishing. And if you really want to kind of dig deeper into it, you could say, well, also people who are looking to get off the hook, longs might use that rally as a chance to get out because it's such a big rally. If it doesn't continue, that deep retrace, they're going to say, you know what, 
I think I better bail out on this stock. It's a chance for me to get off the hook. So the buying exhausts itself, whether it's short covering or bona fide buying, and then the sellers come back in after all that supply, or I, I should say in this case, demand works its way through the system. All that demand works its way through the system. So hopefully that uh, is a plausible explanation. Terry wants to know about GLD. That's going to be gold, the commodity. Well, so far it's in a nice uptrend. And so far it's taken out a lot of the overhead supply like butter. But I think it's got to, I think it has its work cut out for it. But yes, yeah, shorter term, it's still in an uptrend. We have a bow tie off of major lows in here. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. Kind of interesting on a weekly. We're coming off of these uh these multi-year lows in here. And we could bow tie soon. Maybe wait for that weekly bow tie. Not that you want to wait. I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but the fact that it's got so much overhead supply, I like to see it trade a little higher and then pull back before getting too excited about it. Maybe if it gets up here somewhere, we've cleared most of that supply, and I still think it might be worth a shot at that point. So uh, I would kind of uh, let it go for now, and then, but continue to keep an eye out on individual gold stocks for opportunities. Jack Short. All right, let's take a look at that for Mr. Phil. Um, well, this is what I would consider kind of a, almost a second tier short because it's way down here versus like early phases of breaking down way up, way up here. Uh, and it's kind of all over the place and sideways and choppy. Uh, I think it's in a lot of trouble. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't sell puts on it. <laughs> Uh, but I wouldn't rush out and, and short it uh, just yet. But I hear you, though. I see what you're saying. It broke down out of the range. Also, this gap is kind of extreme. I, I find it hard to trade stocks after having an extreme gap down. Look at the short gold, gold the stock, G-O-L-D. Are you kidding me? Draw your arrows. That's a, oof. I don't know about that. I'd be careful. Oof, you brave. See, this is this is one of those charts. They like to pick tops. Be careful. RCL still starting an uptrend? No. Uptrends don't start from high levels. Okay. RCL looks like a short to me. And it's been on the Landry list for quite a while. Uh, we shorted CCL. And RCL turned out to be a pretty good trade, too, which I think was on the Landry list if you go back a few weeks. But, no, I think if anything, I'd rush out. I wouldn't rush out, but I think it'd be worth short. AutoZone, that's home maintenance. No, AutoZone is – AutoZone, that's home maintenance. AutoZone is uh, cars, hence the word auto. Do you ever use W500 or SPU as a broad indication? I use RSP sometimes. What's SPU? I forget what SPU is. Oh, SP equal weight. Yeah, I use RSP. I used to use RSP a lot, which is SP equal weight. I used to use RSP as a proxy for uh, what I call my Landry 100 to compare it. But the Landry 100, I threw the cash into uh, late last year. I'll have to check my notebook, but um, I'm just going to keep that in cash for now and, and decide whether or not I want to continue to maintain that list because it's a lot of work. It's a wonderful exercise, though. I still like to look at the new highs, but it's a lot of work to keep that maintain um, that list. Okay, it's funny. I'm just um, I'm getting a, a webinar announcement for odds probability cone, which I was just talking about. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think it looks like it's in trouble, just like the S&P 500. The the RSP is starting to look more like the S&P 500 now. My concerns with the S&P 500 was that the big cap stocks were the only thing propping it up. But, yeah, it looks a little worse. I, you know, it's probably a good idea to keep an eye on this. Do I – you know, let me interview myself. Do I look at it every day? No. But every day I might pull it up. But I hear you. Uh, it looks a lot worse than the S&P 500. But look no further than the Russell, Terry. And that's the main thing I'm looking at for a broad index. Carol has question marks. I'm not sure what they're, they're for. ORBC is an ideal market for a pullback. That's going to be like an orbital, something orbital, Orbicom. Yeah, 
that looks pretty good. Uh, on a pullback, maybe uh, you cleared out this peak. This peak is way back here, too. This stock's kind of wide and loose, but in more recent times, what has it done? It looks like it's kind of breaking out and trading a little bit. Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Keep that on your list. Home maintenance. I mean, we keep take care of our stuff. Black Swan on what, Kathor? GS? Oops. Uh, Goldman Sachs is definitely in a downtrend. Yeah, on a pullback, maybe. Now, this is a trend resumption type of pattern. And we're probably going to have to start taking more and more of these now that the market is in the early phases of possibly starting the next leg down or the next leg looks like it'll be a leg lower. So, yeah, on a pullback, it might be worth a shot. For T. Okay. Uh, and is it a textbook witch hat set up? It looks like a good chart. What do you think? For Dathan? And? Let's take a look at Ann. Yeah, the uh, problem is you've got this big, huge gap here. And usually after a big, huge gap, stocks get a little hard to trade. Um, tons and tons of overhead supply. So that's a good thing. But too many days of the pullback. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, three, four, five. You got a month of pulling back. So I would pass on that. Uh, is it still a trouble? Probably. Dave, you have an idea as to what REITs dividends day stocked up so everyone else paid a dividend? Um, well, dividends, I think we talked about this a few weeks ago. It's okay to short a stock when there's a dividend, but Dave, don't you have to pay it? Yeah, but if it costs you two bucks, stock usually goes down two bucks because people go in to capture that dividend and sell it after the XD day. And... Sometimes that selling can can push the market even even further lower. So yeah, it's it becomes a wash on a dividend day because you're if it goes down two bucks, you've got you're out two bucks. But longer term, I think it's worthwhile, even in stocks that pay dividends. Okay. How is it? Uh it is well. Okay, we talked about that one. What's the reason behind too many days of the pullback? Well, the reasoning is that the stock has kind of crawled higher for a month or whatever. On the short side, what you want to see happen is you want to see a market just pull back briefly and then bam, because the most amount of people are going to be caught off guard when that occurs. Uh, it's just the way that that my methodology works. I like to see maybe as many as 12 days maximum on the long side and then ideally fewer days on the short side. I like to see just a few days up and then have the market implode. So that's the reasoning. But, yeah, I mean, like we were just looking at that one earlier. It was Amazon or whatever. We looked at a two-day chart, a three-day chart. It still looked like it was in a lot of trouble. STZ for Mr. Thomas. STZ. Um, this is one that I had on my Landry list a while back. But the reason that we didn't go with it is that it's got a lot of support along the way. But here we go. It's a food, or I guess more um, technically, uh, uh, liquor. <laughs> and, you know, if we get in a bear market, I guess people are going to drink more liquor. But now you can see uh, too many of the pullback and then lots of support. But, yeah, I think it's still in trouble. Okay, any more? Joy? This is the first pull boy, pullback. we got a, just a few minutes left. You guys want to keep asking them? Yeah, Joy looks good. Um Decent volume, longer term, kind of scraping bottom here, bow tie. Yeah, that looks great. Uh, you got a little bit of overhead supply to deal with, but no, that's fine. That That's kind of an interesting setup. Good eye, Howard. Okay, any more? we got a couple of minutes left. Okay, Richard, thanks for showing up. Appreciate it. Okay, while well, I'm in an impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Oh, here we go. If we always get a couple of the last bit. Hey, Karen, good to see you. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, ECA is just kind of uh, – oops, what happened? What's a fat finger somewhere? I don't know what happened. Let's see. ECA. Yeah, I don't know what's – something bad tick or something somewhere. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can see that it's kind of bottomed out here a little bit, but it's too soon to buy. You're welcome, Heather. FTR. 
Uh, no, too wide and loose. Uh, this one, I would, it's just kind of all over the place lately, but it, on a relative strength basis, doing, doing pretty good. You can't live off relative strength. Love the guns. Uh, don't necessarily love the stock just yet, but if it makes new highs, maybe I'll pull back. This isn't a ticker that is. Thanks. You're welcome. LMT and our GDN, GNX. LMT. Oops, LMT. No, uh, too wide and loose and sideways. Draw your, go back to the slide that I did on net net. Draw your line, okay? Or GDX. GDX is gonna be like something gold, right? Yeah. Now gold's in an uptrend, and you've got your bow tie. The trigger to bow tie was back here, but as we would say, gold's got a lot of uh, bad memories to deal with, a lot of overhead supply. Groupon, GRPN, fulfill. Okay. Um. I don't like the huge gap up. I like gaps to be within reason. This is also what I would call a, uh, a, a bottle rocket. Go in and watch the video on my videos page, I think, or on the – if you go to the store and go to stock selection, there's a video on uh, uh, stock picking, an introduction video. And in it, I talk about the bottle rockets. And bottle rockets, we have a stock go up 100% in a few days. It's just very hard to sustain. So I would I would leave that one alone. Okay. All right. Well, we're out of time. Uh, again, I want to appreciate everybody for coming. Thank you so much for being here. I'm flattered that you would be here. Uh, stay tuned. We'll probably have a sale soon uh, on something. I'm kind of in that mode right now. Uh, so check the website over the next couple of days. And everybody, enjoy your weekend if we don't talk again. And then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls next weekend. I'm sorry, next week, next Thursday. Thank you so much.